In the late 1800s, the largest gold rush east of the Mississippi took place in a small southern town, Dahlonega, Georgia, which became known as Gold City. How fitting that a traditional southern gospel quartet would emerge from this same small town to offer an everlasting treasure to all who hear and to set a new standard for southern gospel music. Since 1980, Gold City has achieved unprecedented success with over 75 major industry awards, more than any other group performing today. Steadfast, humble, and unaffected by their fame and recognition, Gold City remains true to their cause to reach as many people with the message of Jesus Christ until the midnight cry. I'd like for people to continue to look at Gold City as a group that they can depend on. They can listen to them sing and know that they know what they're singing about. And that they believe what they're singing about. As long as the world stands, there's going to be a place for a witness in the music ministry. We'll be going home. When I think about great groups in Southern Gospel history, and I look back over the past century and names like the Stamps Quartet and the Blackwood Brothers and the Statesmen and the Rangers. And then I come on up into my lifetime and think about the groups in the last 20 years, Gold City, the Kingsmen, the Cathedrals. You know, these are groups that led the way and uh, these are groups that that had a sound that at, at a certain period in our history, um, more than anything else, you know, they, they had a sound that was nobody else could duplicate. First time I met Gold City, uh, we were in Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, my cousin Russell Jr. went down to play steel guitar on their record. Never heard of Gold City, didn't know what that was about. And the first fellow I met was Gary Jones. At the time, he was 17, 18. He wasn't very old. We just got to talking and hit it off. They really took a liking to me because my brother was Steve Rabbit Easter of the Happy Goodman family, the little banjo player the Goodmans had. And Floyd Beck, the owner of Gold City, thought, well, shoot, if Rabbit can play, Jeff can play, you know. And I remember getting this old $50 banjo. It was horrible, you know, and three, two, one, five, two, one, trying to learn a banjo row, and I never did and still can't play a banjo, but Floyd Beck thought I could. <laughs> Gold City has always been what we call radio friendly. All of their hint, all of their singles, all of their, what became hits, uh, were always good radio songs. And that had a lot to do, of course, with Gold City's success. You need radio to be successful. And I mean, they did all this stuff, you know, bluegrasses don't do, you know, they go, hank, 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 you know, and I'm like, and then they get, they say, watch old Jake, ho, hank, I'm like, you know, bluegrass, you don't do that. You just sing by letter, open up and let her fly, you know. Their first song that hit the chart was back in 1982, and people didn't yet know Gold City. So the song only got to number 38, I've Got a Feeling. Oh, that was a good song. And chart-wise, that's just a blip. But less than a year later, they had their next song, In My Robe of White, and that went to number three on the charts. And what a powerful song that was. People still ask Old City for In My Robe of White. In my robe of white, I will fly away to that land so fair. In my Jesus, there it will be so grand. When I get to that land in my robe of white, I will fly away. Yes, in my robe of white, I will fly away. When I was working my way through college, I was a part-time DJ in Georgia, and we played Southern Gospel music. And one of the very first groups that I ever played, the, as a matter of fact, the first day that I walked into the station was Gold City. By that time, the group had changed a little bit from the first time that I saw them. But at that time, they had songs like, I think I'll read it again, In My Robe of White, John Saw, and the quartet had really solidified to a very unique sound, uh, even though they held on to the traditional aspects of Southern Gospel music, they added just a little bit of a modern touch, and at that time, there was hardly a group on the road that could touch them. A lot of their strongest songs, their biggest hits, came from Sandy Knight. 
There seemed to be something about Sandy Night's songs that were just perfect for the way Gold City was singing and still is singing. It sounds like John Saw were Sandy Night songs. John Saw, just for In the early 80s, Floyd Beck called me and he said he had a group that he wanted to go on one of our singing cruises. I didn't know Floyd Beck, but he knew Eldridge Fox and we were big friends. So Floyd came, brought his group, and uh, they did a fabulous job on the cruise right off the bat. They were recommended to me by Eldridge Fox of the Kingsman. So Eldridge had, he was with Benson, uh, the record company. And so he was instrumental in helping to get Gold City with Benson, and, and then of course with me. So immediately, uh, we be, you know, they had hit songs. Somebody who wrote my life story, though the ink never touched the writer's quill. five-year period there seems to be one group at the top and uh, in the mid to late 1980s that group was Gold City. They had a wonderful group uh, in the late 1980s Tim Riley singing bass, uh, Mike Lefevre, uh, Brian Free and Ivan Parker and when I first heard them I was just blown away. I think as I began to research the music, it, and, and I've tried to think, now this group, this great male quartet singing now, how do they compare with the, with the great groups that I grew up on, like the Blackwoods and the Statesmen? And in some ways they compared because they f followed that four-part harmony male tradition and also liked those groups, and I think this may be the greatest tribute to Gold City. Like those groups, not only did they perpetuate that tradition, but they understood that great groups lead, and Gold City was innovative. And I think that's the mark of a great group, and when the history of the 1980s and 1990s is finally written, Gold City will play a prominent role in that. Not only because they continued a tradition, but they set precedence too. The thing that I saw in Gold City, and really the thing that made me wanted to work really hard for them, and made it a whole lot easier was the fact of working with Tim Riley. People have asked me before, what is the secret to Gold City success? And I tell them every time two words, Tim Riley. Sometimes I get so tangled up in those 
In order to do what Gold City's done, you have to have the heart for it. And you have to be willing to eat pork and beans on the side of the road. And you have to be willing to drive three, four, five hundred miles between dates. Every time they release a recording, ship a single to radio, you know that that song is going to be of the utmost quality. It's going to be professionally and expertly and excellently produced to the maximum. And that is what is the distinguishing characteristic of Gold City. I'm going to let the glory roll when the roll is called in for me. I'm going to get inside of the sound when I get beside the king and day. I'm going to have a time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm going to get carried away when I get carried away. I'm going to let the glory roll when the roll is One thing I learned from Gold City was that the, the musicians are there to compliment the singers, and a lot of bands never get that, you know, it's like, and they stayed on Paul Noski. I mean, he loved to beat the drums and, and uh, uh, play them. If we was in a small church, he just, they'd just have, tell him, you can hold it down, hold it down, you gotta play. And it did, it just, uh, the whole deal of doing the, the thing with Gold City, trained me to this day. Matter of fact, my drummer, Greg Ritchie, is Jerry Ritchie's son, and he plays for me, and uh, I always pick at him. I said, you know, for years I played bass, and your daddy would turn around and say, that bass is too loud, your bass is too loud. And I'd get ticked off, say, you're singing what's too loud, my bass make you sound good. When the history's written, Gold City will be in the top 10 groups. And it takes more, more than singing. It's, there's something you can't exactly put your finger on. It's uh, charisma or an unknown factor that that some groups can sing well and they don't have it, but Gold City they can sing well and they do have it. I was raised in a Christian home. I, you know, we were Baptists, and I'll never forget in uh, 1948 when we moved to the to the house that I was raised in, and my dad was the uh, minister of music at the First Baptist Church there in a little town called Glencoe, Alabama, right outside of Gadsden, Alabama, and uh, he he was a harmony person. Uh, if we went anywhere, we was whistling, we whistled in harmony. If we sang, we sang in harmony. If we got off of the part, he would correct us and teach 
all of us the different parts and uh, uh, it was I've just been involved in music all of my life I played we had an old pump organ and uh, I would come home and I could just barely reach the keys and I'd pump with one foot and reach up and play what they had in church that day and everybody was just fascinated with that and my school teachers always said that if they'd put my lessons to music that I'd make straight A's, but I never made straight A's. Well, I sang with a, a, a local group there called the Gadsden Harmoniers. And uh, then I started singing with a group called the Carter Family and Kathy from Adamsville, Alabama. Well, Dale's mother lived in Adamsville, Dale Shellnut with the Dixie Echoes. And uh, we did an album in Studio B at RCA. The name of that album was A Child Talks With God. That was the first album I'd ever done. Well, Dale's mom bought one because she lived there in Adams before the Carter family was from. And he heard the album and he called me. And I got on, he you know, wanted to know if I wanted to try it with them. Well, they was in, up in Nashville doing an album. So I got on a Trailways bus and went to Nashville to try out with them. And I got to meet Dwayne Allen. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because he sang with the Oak Ridge Boys and I thought they were so cool then. And uh, Mr. Whitfield was the bass singer for the Dixie Echoes then and the doctor advised him to come off the road. So I tried out with him and we was in Batesville, Arkansas. He said, well, what do you think, Riley? said, do you think you'd like to have this job? I said, yes, sir, I sure would. He said, well, $125 a week sound okay? I said, sounds great to me. And that's when I got my first job. Well, I went on one trip with them, and I got home to get some more clothes, and I had my draft notice. Uncle Sam called, so they was drafting for Vietnam, and I had to leave and go to go do my stench in the military. But uh, then as soon as I got back, Ken Turner was going with the Blackwood Brothers, and Dale sent word, said, if you're interested, call me. If you're not, I'll see you around. Well, of course, I was interested because I'd started something I never got to finish. When I uh, left the Dixie Echoes in June of 73, and we started Gold City in 1980, well, I met Floyd while I was with the Southland. He wanted to put a group together. His dad was the original bass singer for the original Gold City Quartet that broke up in 1949. Floyd uh, was thrilled to death, and he, it, it touched him to have another Gold City Quartet. You know, Dahlonega is called the Gold City, where Floyd lived. His family had been on that farm for 150 years. I've never had a better friend than Floyd Beck and his wife, Mary Ann. And, uh, but he put, uh, put the group together, and he bought a bus from somebody and had it fixed up, a big mural painted on the side of it. And, well, when we drove up to Bonifay, Florida, they said, who in the world is that, you know, uh, in that big bus? Because we didn't merit it, you know, uh, because we, we hadn't sang anywhere together hardly. But uh, Mr. Whitfield was very gracious to us, uh, besides giving me my first professional job in gospel music. Uh, he also let us come and sing and get before the people, and uh, that's how Gold City got its start. He's a fountain for a thirsty soul. He is the healer and so.
Through the mid-1980s, Gold City stole the hearts of gospel music fans with their unmistakable sound and charisma. Then, in 1987, one song, one extraordinary song, would forever become synonymous with the Gold City Quartet. Midnight Cry was a song that it was so powerful in what it said and how it said it that the message of the song just could not be ignored. Um, and it's amazing subsequently how that song has touched so many people around the world for so long. And it seemed to be a very timely song. Uh, you know, the, the promise of the Lord's return has always been a, a, a favorite topic of mine. And uh, Midnight Cry speaks to that so clearly and so powerfully that uh, it just had to be a big song. And of course it was for so long. It's almost become, I don't know if you'd call it their signature song. It was uh, such an innovative song and such a timely song that it, uh, it just touched not just the hearts of Gold City fans, but it touched the whole industry. And uh, when we started looking back at the last hundred years trying to figure out what are the great songs of the first century of Southern Gospel, Midnight Cry was one of those songs. And um, so I think in the, in the final analysis, you know, this is an industry of music, not just personalities. And it, it's the songwriters and then the singers being able to present that message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when you can link a great song or a number of great songs with a group, that's what will live on. It'll never die. I hear the of a mighty Russian wind And it's closer now Than it's ever been I can almost hear the trumpet
At the midnight cry When Jesus comes again I look around me And I see prophecies fulfilling Oh, in signs of the time, they're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father. bass singer on the road in Southern Gospel music today. Has a very distinct voice, uh, has a unique quality in his voice, and no matter whether it's a fast song or a slow song, it's very clear, pronounces his words extremely clear, very distinct, uh, and when you hear a Gold City song on the radio today, uh, once Tim opens his mouth, you know it's Gold City, easily. Uh, and it's been that way since day one. He's been the anchor of the group, both in terms of a vocalist and as a manager. And uh, his sound has never changed. As a matter of fact, it's probably gotten better. My voice never changed like most uh, boys' voice, where it crackles. He's, you don't know where you're going to be talking high or low. My voice just sort of went down gradually. And how I became a bass singer was I was laying, I'll never, I'll never forget this, I was laying on the couch one Sunday afternoon reading the funny papers. And Mr. Ward, my agriculture teacher that was the head of the FFA, and I was in the FFA because it was sort of like a sham class <laughs> you get to go to, he come by the house and said, we're starting the FFA quartet and we want Tim to come and uh, sing with us in it. And I didn't want to go. My dad just sort of did that thumb thing, you know, just like this. Well, I, you, you didn't question that. You, I got up and I got dressed, and I went to practice, and I, that's when I started singing bass with the FFA Quartet. I had a, a wide range. I could sing alto or I could sing bass. And uh, we sang songs like uh, Cool, Cool Water and, uh, you know, Rainbow of Love and stuff like that. But uh, it, it was... My voice never changed like that. Well, the Bible speaks 
of famines and trials in the last day how they'll sweep through our land but we have his assurance that through all these trials we'll be led by his mighty hand manna from God will come down from above to restore and to nourish our soul so through all of your trials and all of your fears remember God has it under control next verse and see if you can relate to it. Like you may be like David of old and the giant trial you may face but just when it seems you're standing alone You'll find Jesus standing there in your place With a stone of faith, your child will fall And Jesus, all the victory will give So today, as back then, Remember God, he's still got it under control. supposed to do but it's I've been very frustrated at times I've quit 10,000 times I learned early in life that it's not how smart you are but it's the people 
that you gather around you to make something successful. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just an uh, instrument, and God has put me in that position. And it hadn't been an easy position. Uh, you deal with all kind of personalities, uh, but the main thing in managing a group in Christian music is gathering the people around you that can stand up there and mean what they're saying. I'm not saying there's anybody perfect, but you've got to have men of integrity. Uh, and you've got to live the life before them. It was the third day since he died. And it was said. As any group, Gold City went through a tremendous change, and at that time it would have been very easy to get discouraged. Tim, I called Tim several, several times, and we tried to encourage him and, and uh, tell him that he can do it again, and he did. 
He took, he took uh, the group, the old group that was on top, then he went through the transition, and now he's got probably the strongest group in the industry. When the opportunity came along for me to sing, uh, with Gold City, Tim Riley had called my house, and he remembered my dad. And there was one night back in, uh, when I was a senior in high school, uh, my dad and I went to the home church of Gold City for a revival and my dad and I both sang that night and Tim heard me sing and remembered that and this was some this was four or five years later and he called me and said uh, our tenor's leaving would you mind auditioning and so I said yeah so I, I, I went down and tried out or met them somewhere on the road and tried out and uh, he hired me four days later so and the rest as they say is history so I'll be honest with you, it wasn't money, it wasn't fame, it was anything. God led me. It was ever, the chain of events had to be of God that, that put me where I am with Gold City. So I talked to Tim, and Tim said, well, I'm not going to hire you unless I talk to your mother and daddy, and we get this all straight. My mom and dad were very supportive of my decision, and uh, so old saying goes, here I are, and that's the way it all turned out. <laughs> a lot of people wondered why I wasn't singing with them already. And, uh, you know, I believe that God's timing is perfect, and I believe that he had a reason for uh, holding me back. And I, I probably won't know what that reason is until I get to heaven. But, uh, I, it, you know, it's, it's been a challenge for me. You know, you'd think that sitting and listening to that group every night, night for over four years, you'd know all their songs, and uh, I didn't know all their songs as well as I thought I did, but. Uh. I see Gold City with a unique sound simply because there it's a collection of guys that has uh, been appointed uh, on the same bus at the same time to be together, and we've all got one thing in mind, one, one focus, and that is to reach as many people as we can for Christ. For much too long the church has been an underdog to the feet of men, but God's building a church on the rise. We've been trampled on in the heat of the fight. This church is God's eternal bride, and it's almost time for the church to fly. God's building a church. It's gonna march like a mighty army man. God's building a church. It'll be water to a dry and barren land. God's building a church. It's gonna rise from the valley of dead dry bones. Sanctified, glorified, filled with a holy ghost, power and might. Purified with fire divine. God's building a church.
we signed with the Benson Company, Bill Trailer, he said, uh, you know, somebody told me that you'd like to have some hair. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I, I, I thought about it, you know, but I never had the nerve. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a promise. I'll, I'll get you some hair. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sort of like Jake Cash. Everybody knows I wore hair for years, and Jake's took a lot of ribbing. Of course, me and him both thick skin that don't bother us. But uh, I'll never forget, I went to a place in Nashville, and Bill had me fixed up and got me some hair. And I walked out of that place, I felt like I had a bale of hay on my head. Because, you know, when you thin for as many years, and I thought folks was actually sticking their head out of their car windows and looking at me. <laughs> And that was so funny, and we was on a road trip, Brian Free took my hair. I, I usually set it on top of my baseball cap. Well, it was in the way or something, he just set it up on a, on a lamp that was hanging on the wall. Well, somebody come in there and cut that lamp on. But I looked around, and my hair was smoking. <laughs> and I snatched that thing off of that thing. I just knew I was going to have one of those, one of those little sp ball spots right on top of it, you know, but it didn't burn it up, but I was, oh, listen, well, they lie. Well, I'm not giving up. Oh, no, I'm not turning out for my Through the valley, through this veil of tears, times I've even questioned, even if my Lord was near. Many times that old tempter, he says, why not turn around? You can't get any farther, all because you're just losing. In ground, oh, but I'm not giving up. Oh, no, I'm not turning out for my the grace of God. I win a shining crown someday, and I'm gonna keep holding on. Yes, to that nail scar that. Oh, no, I'm not giving up. you mind to tell me there's been something bothering me why is it that old devil he just won't let God's children be you see he has purpose and determined to get right in the way and turn us from the way of life and lead our souls Oh, but I'm not giving up Oh, no, I'm not turning out For by the grace of God I wear a shining crown Someday and I'm gonna keep holding on Yes, to that nail scar hand Oh, no, I'm not giving up
You know, most people realize later in life what they could have learned from their from their parents, and uh, I'm learning what I can learn from my dad, and I'm actually been able to learn from him. I'm um, able to learn from what he's what he's done all these years. I'm he's basically showing me how he's done it. You know, I was raised. I watched Gold City from the time they started. I remember when they came to our house and they gathered around the piano at the very beginning just to see what it would sound like. And I've, uh, I've had a front row seat for the whole thing. All through, through the years I've watched how my dad has handled business and how he's handled situations. Um, and I wouldn't take anything for that. He's taught my brother and me a lot about uh, the traveling aspect. He, He's taught us a lot about being a Christian. Uh, probably most of all, how to be a man and deal with people and and always present ourselves in a classy way. You know, uh, I've got a lot to learn still in that department. You know, I, you know, I've got so much to learn. I'm just 31 years old, and uh, and he's my probably my biggest role model. And I hope that my boys can carry this on when I can't go on it anymore. I know there's a time coming when I won't be able to get on the bus and go. Uh, and I hope my grandson will follow right on in. And it, it should be, it's like a family tradition. It should go on and, and because there's, as long as the world stands, there's gonna be a place for a witness in the music ministry. Back during the days of the Great Western Quartet Convention, the very first time there was one in Fresno, California, the cathedrals uh, were nearing the end of their career, and Jonathan always had a deep love and respect for Glenn Payne, as, as most everybody does. One day during the convention, we ran into Glenn in the hotel lobby. And Glenn was in no hurry to go wherever he was heading, so he just stopped and we just started talking. And Jonathan, who's, who always wants to learn a little bit more about what he's doing, uh, how to perfect it, if you will, took the opportunity to ask Glenn some very pointed questions. Uh, and then they got to talking. And for 10 minutes, Jonathan asked questions. But for the next two hours, Glenn Payne answered those questions and plenty more. I think Glenn's, his, one of the best things he ever told me was, you never know who's listening. You never know who's watching. Always be a child of God. More importantly, always act as a child of God should, wherever you are. Be who you are, and uh, when you hit that stage, you get one chance that night. <laughs> so go for it. Well, there once was a time when in my heart I was condemned to die. I was walking in my sinful, sinful way. Sinful way. Jesus paid the ransom for my soul. I made this world goodbye. When it calls me, I'll fly, fly.
taken a, a lot of people for Gold City to be where it is. It's not me. It's not any one of those guys. It's, it, it's taken somebody that could watch your back and take care of you legally. Used to, we just went out and sang. But now there's so many legal ramifications in what we do. Russ Fair has been a very, very dear friend to me. Becky Simmons, all the way back to 1982, I'll never forget when we first signed with her. And she's, her and Sonny took us on, and we were nobody. They're what I would call Christian dynamite. If you like quartet singing, uh, you're not going to hear anything any better. Uh, the lyrics of their songs mean something. They very carefully pick them. And when they walk on stage, there is a feeling you get any time any professional walks on stage. And that's the thing that is so unique about all of these guys. They know what they're singing about, their testimonies are real, but absolutely professional to the core as far as being able to entertain you. The best part to me is about a year ago, being in Jacksonville, Florida at Westside Baptist Church and seeing a 65-year-old woman getting saved. That's the best part. Or seeing a teenager who is dressed, you know, in the style of teenagers, of course, like a popular style of dress, maybe not your church dress, seeing uh, that message that those guys are singing and that we're supporting, seeing that message cut through and a teenager just comes squalling and falling in the altar. That's the best part. It's Still the Cross is such a powerful song and it carries such a powerful message. And to stand on the stage and sing that song is, is very humbling. And I recorded it and it became such a blessing. And to stand on stage, you wonder why, you know, God, why did you choose me to deliver this message to these people? And uh, I, I don't know why he chose me. I'm glad he did because I love the song. I love to sing it and, uh, you know, I. I mean, wow, what, what can you say? I mean, I've done nothing to deserve that. It's not conservative or liberal, however they're defined. It's not about interpretation or the judgment of the mind. It's the opposite of politics power or prestige it's about a simple message and whether we believe it's still the cross it's still the blood of calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captive free it's still Preach 
your word to suit our needs. We can justify sweet, subtle lies that are wrapped in noble deeds. We can alter our convictions to adapt to social wills. But we cannot change the gospel or the truth contained within. Still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captive free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost. It's still the never fails when we do the medley that I, I'll have a veteran come up to me with tears in his eyes or just you know just talking about how much that meant to him and it's just it's very rewarding and um, I just that that I was a part of something that the Lord has blessed to touch people's lives that that just means so much I was in Vietnam 13 months and uh, I was a medic there. I was there during the Tet Offensive and that's when there's just a lot of uh, action going on. And I finally got away from there and flew into San Francisco and I just got down on my all fours and kissed the ground when I got off of that airplane. But the people that was cursing and swearing and spitting toward us uh, as we came out of the plane, and I could have cared less. I was home, you know, and there's been so many times that, I, you know, I thought I'd never make it home. I would, I'd go back today if they called me to keep that mess away from you and my wife and my children and my grandchildren, to keep our country free. And I wish the Americans would rally around the flag. If we don't get that oneness again, if we don't get that red, white, and blue patriotism again, I don't know what's going to happen here. I, I love my country with all of its faults. This is the greatest place in the world to live and to raise a family. I'm, I'm very patriotic. Uh, I think every young man ought to have to spend at least two years in the military to understand what that red, white, and blue stands for and realize that it's something to be respected and revered because of what it took for us to enjoy all the freedoms that we have today. Oh, say 